Okay, uh, hi again everyone. So it's uh, SpiffyQ, SpiffyQ.com. This is uh, part 13 or so of the opening survey, and which we're now, we're finally going to switch gears, and we're going to be looking at um, the openings that start with 1D4, and everything that goes along with them. So for you 1D4 players, yay, you get to finally uh, hear my take on the plans and the different ideas. I'll just say off the bat is that I've pretty much been a 1E4 player my entire life. I've it's been like 4 to 1 the number of uh, like serious games that I've played E4 to D4. So I just I have less practical experience in many of these um, lines. And so um, whereas with 1E4 I have practical experience and I know I tend to know what happens um, you know what club players tend to do versus what the masters tend to do. Um, here, I only know what, what's in books, <laughs> essentially. So it might be um, not as useful, but it also means the videos will probably be shorter. Just want to get that out of the way um, right away. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to start by looking at, um, well, the Queen's Gambit, and specifically the Queen's Gambit declined. All the various ways that you can decline the Gambit. And I guess the first thing is, why do you want to uh, decline the Gambit in the first place? What's wrong with just taking the pawn? Of course, there actually isn't anything wrong with taking the pawn, and the next video um, I cover, I'll talk about the Queen's Gambit accepted, where we take it. But we can just see in general, is that if black were to take the pawn, white's going to win it back at some point. Let's just, uh, let's put a random move on. Let's, uh, what's a random move? Well, I'll just do the main line, why not? And what, what we can see here is that material is equal, but white has two center pawns, two very nice center pawns, while black only has the one. And after these pawns eventually get exchanged, white just has an advantage in the center. And that, that, that's it. White's going to have more central influence. That, that isn't the whole story, of course. There's other factors as well. But there's very few people who play the Queen's Gambit as white that hate the Queen's Gambit accepted. Almost universally, you're going to find people that love playing as white, the Queen's Gambit accepted. Because you get control of the center, all your pieces get developed very, very easily, and... Things are great. And so um, there's been various ways of trying to restrict that, of not giving white a advantage in the center, of not giving white um, supreme um, development and mobility, whatever he wants to do. And so we're going to look at them uh, very quickly. And I'm actually, I want to start with um, the classical Queen's Gambit declined. Just because when I first saw this, I think it was in, it was probably in, uh, in Terash, the game of chess. But I know also it was in um, uh, Chess for Dummies, which was at the library. And it's just, looking at this, it seems as if this opening, the Queen's Gambit declined, is just absolutely everything white wants. Because if you could just look at the pawn structure, all right? So where we want to put our knights? We want to put our knights here and here. Where do you think we should put our bishops? Well, this bishop probably goes here, and after we move the e-pawn, this bishop will go there. Uh, we're going to castle, and then we're going to put our rooks somewhere. And that's exactly what's going to happen in the classical Queen's Gambit decline. The, um, I'm just going to put some random moves here. Okay. Um, castle. Chess space, you're an amazing program. Okay. And if we look at the old orthodox defense, I believe it was this position that was discussed in both of the books. And if you just look at it, this these bishops are on their best squares, the knights are on the best squares. Uh... Black's bishop is bad because it's behind all of its pawns. This knight is not on as good of a square. White has more space. Like, what more can you want in an opening? And then after, you know, castle, let's just put some uh, random moves here. We can see how the rooks can go to any of the files. And white, he can play, he can try and do an attack on the king's side. He can try and push in the center. He can try and push on the queen's side. It just seems as if white has absolutely everything he could possibly want in this position. Isn't this a perfect opening? Like, what more can you want as white? And why would you ever want to play this as black? Uh, this, is, this is an extremely passive way of playing for black. Um, uh, the old orthodox defense was black trying to just limit white's advantage and not fight at all. And of course, by not fighting at all, you actually give white a pretty easy game, which is the equivalent of giving him an advantage. And so there's better ways of playing for black. You can actually see, what's pro what is the problem with black here? Well, the problem is black doesn't really know what he's doing. This bishop is terrible. Um, until he moves that bishop, this rook isn't doing anything. Black has no real plan. Uh, things aren't very good. 
And so um, one of the things that Black tries to do is, well, he wants to try and get this bishop into the game. And now oh, my complete lack of theory is going to show in here, but I believe it's something like, let's just look at this. Sure, why not? Is something with b6. With the idea of we're going to take, and then our bishop has a perfect diagonal. Now you might be thinking, aha, well white's going to stop that by taking this. Okay, well now this diagonal is open, and the bishop's going to develop this way, so everything is fine. So what black is trying to do is figure a way to get this bishop into the game. White, he's just doing whatever. And if I were to actually uh, just sort of back up here. So that is, sorry, the classic queen's gambit decline, uh, where white just gets completely great development, black is hanging on to the center, and then his main goal is to figure out what to do with that bishop. In general, it's either some combination of this, that works really well, also possible is just playing um, c5 and then e5, or just playing e5 at a certain point. For instance, taking, you know, we got the knight d7, e5 in there. Because if black can do that, if black is able to successfully get e5 without losing a pawn or giving white a huge attack, then his bishop comes out, everything's happy. Same thing. If black is able to successfully put his bishop here and then, you know, open the center, say, his bishop's completely happy. Similar to certain lines of the, uh, the French Rubenstein and other um, openings like so. So that's the general plan. What about for white? Uh, besides just putting your pieces on normal squares and see what happens. One of the main uh, um, weapons at white is actually this, which is the exchange variation, which at first glance looks like, doesn't this just solve black's problem? Because now the bishop can come out wherever and everything is perfectly fine. And this is one of those areas where, yes, that's completely true. But it seems as if in practice, white just has a very easy time. And the main reason for that, uh, th th there's kind of two reasons. One is that white is able to do a certain option, which looks something like this, where he's developed. Notice how he hasn't developed the knight right away? Well, white's idea is actually to put the knight on e2, to play f3, and then we'll play e4 at some point. White can either castle kingside, uh, which is the safe option, or you know he can move the queen and then castle queenside like a caveman, and then prepare to attack black. Um, but either way, this is a very difficult... Um, this has asked black some very hard problems, and um, certainly at amateur level, this still scores extremely well for white. Uh, it's almost as if white is playing for two results, either a win or a draw, and then black is just hanging on. And I'll be honest, I find these positions as black very, very um, difficult. Just practically speaking, it's hard to figure out what to do. I don't like them in the bit, which is one main reason that I've never played this, ever. This d5, e6 lines. I do not find these, this opening attractive. But another idea, oh, sure, we'll just keep it here, is instead of trying to do this king's high attack, to do something that's mysteriously called the minority attack. If you've never, um, if, like the first time you hear that, what the heck is that minority attack? And... It's silly, in all honesty. Uh, but you can see here, black has four pawns on the queen side, and then there's only three on the king side. Um, and so, that is said, this is black's pawn majority. And so for white, he's got, what, uh, five pawns here on the king side, and only two pawns on the queen side. And so this would be considered a pawn minority, because there are fewer pawns on this side than on this side, if we were to back up. If we were to imagine, you know... Um, something like this, you know, like the French exchange, or something something, there's equal pawns on each. So there's uh, no real majority, no real minority, it's just, it's completely symmetrical. Um, minorities and majorities, they come into play when there's that difference, right? White has two pawns here to black's four, and then there's five to three. So anyway, the whole point of the minority attack is to take these pawns, throw them up the board, basically trade two of these pawns for two of these pawns, and then black is left with only um, a weakness. And so, uh, for instance, if we just, just humor me, I'm not saying this is a, uh, this is perfect or anything, just, just to show the idea. You know, uh, da, 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 da. let's do take, 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 
Something like that. Why not? Okay. So as you can see, white has um, successfully gotten rid of all of his pawns. Black is left with one pawn on the queen side. And it's isolated. It's by itself. And so what white can do is he's going to put his major pieces. He's just going to target that pawn with everything he's got. And black's going to be stuck defending that pawn. And that's the whole idea of the minority attack. And again, this is also something that's really, really um, effective, especially at amateur play. And it has been effective up until very recently in um, sort of Grandmaster play. It's only been the last, what, 10, 15 years that the minority attack has really um, dropped down. No longer is white winning comfortably all the time. Um, it's, you know, it's a lot more draws. Like, everything's a draw nowadays anyway, right? But it's, uh, black seems to have figured it out at master level. But if you ask me how, I don't really know. <laughs> well, the general idea is that, okay, as white is trying everything here on the king side, black is going to try and do something in the center on the king side. And so there's things like this. Sometimes he gets f4 in there, um, you know, do, do, and he's trying to attack over on this side. The thing is, I've never found the attack very easy to do, and most amateurs don't. And so this is why that queen's gambit declined, and the exchange variation in particular tends to do very well for white, to the point where uh, it's... It's odd. It's one of those openings that they recommend you, you play to really learn about chess, because it's so classical. Like, it's black defending the center, and it's right. And I'm not trying to say it's unsound. I am saying it's a lot harder to play than uh, I think a lot of people give credit for. And it's very easy for black to drift into a worse position, and it's much easier for white to play normal moves and do well than it is for black to play normal moves and do well. At least in my experience, as limited as it may be. Fortunately, this is not the only way to decline the uh, the queen's gambit. There is also what's known as the Slav. Uh, there's actually two different varieties of this Slav: the semi-Slav and I guess the full Slav. Let's look at the uh, the regular Slav or the full Slav. The Slav first. This is where Black is going to take. And what's nice about this? Um, this is in my opinion, much more in two. Let's just do a couple more moves. White pretty much has to play a4 here, because otherwise black can play d5 and keep the pawn. Yay. Um, is, but by playing a5, sorry, by playing a4, we can see how this square is now free for a black piece. And so the bishop is there. Currently, it's pinged the knight. Maybe we've got some knight e4 action coming in. We've got, you know, knight a6 can come into this uh, square, or knight d5 can come into this square. More often, the knight will come to d... not that square. The, to come to d7, or the rook will come to d7. And then the knight is able to help with one of these pawn breaks in, in the future, more or less. And this position, um, it's, certainly, it's certainly very solid. It's very good. I find this much more intuitive to play for the second player. It, your pieces are actually doing something. They're not just sitting there uh, being very huddled. That said, again, white does have the two center pawns to one, and the general idea is to castle. He's going to move the knight or put a rook or a queen on the e-file, prepare f3 maybe, but certainly play e4 and d5, and white can dominate in the center. Um, Black is trying to not let that happen, and certainly his pieces are moving uh, quite well. And the main break for Black is not that, is to get that e5 in. Um, very often Black is able to get e5, and then the game is perfectly fine, perfectly even, and uh, Black is doing great. So that's sort of the, the slob in a nutshell. That's certainly the way that I, um, I would want to play if I were... Uh, like, compared to these two, and like, it just intuitively, right? We play e6, the bishop sucks. Or we can play c6, we're still defending our pawn, we're still protecting the center, but our bishop can move. The uh, reason people don't like the Slav, many people, is because of the exchange variation. It's always the exchange variation, right? Um, well, this tends to be an extremely uh, dull game. Um, both sides are going to play knight c3, knight f3, you know, we're going to have both the bishops on normal squares, we castle, and there's very little tension in the center, but there's no tension in the center at all. And... Neither side really wants to ever um, break in the center too soon, because if white were to play e4 at some point, well, after taking, even if you win the pawn back, you're stuck with an isolated pawn. And it's the same thing for black. If black ever plays e5, trying to get active, well, then he's stuck with an isolated pawn. And so, in practice, both sides just kind of sit there, not really moving, yawn, then it's a draw. And so this is, <laughs> I'm exaggerating just a little bit, but this is why people don't like 
um, the exchange slab in particular. Now that said, this isn't the only uh, variety of slab. Again, not that. There's what is known as um, the semi-slab. Now if you were to look at this and say, hey Smithy, isn't this a lot like the Queen's Gambit declined? I would say yes, because I honestly don't see, or I don't understand intuitively the difference between the two of them, um, as well as I do with certain other openings. And certainly, it's certainly possible, I'm probably saying certainly too much, to simply transpose right back into, because this here is, uh, now we're in the Queen's Gambit decline again. The real problem, so to speak, uh, or what really makes this unique, or what can make it unique compared to the Queen's Gambit, would be what's known as like the bot the Nick variation, I believe. Where black takes, white gets the center, black keeps his pawn. And then there's these mammoth variations that go something like this, where white says, I'm going to sacrifice a piece, and then we have something like this. And I'll be honest, I have no idea what's going on in these positions. Uh, sometimes I think I do. No. Uh, they are ridiculous. And this is not something you can just rely about general plans about. Uh, this is something you actually need to <laughs> hunker down, look at some theory if you really want to play and really want to understand these positions. Uh, sometimes black will often play bishop b bishop b7, queen b6, c5 in some order. Sure, white's temporary sacrifice a piece, but he's going to win it back. Uh, and then there's king safety. There's just so much going on in this position. It's very, very concrete. It's something you, again, you'll need to look at. Um, it's Fascinating positions, but not my cup of tea, not something I really enjoy playing, not something I've ever had any success with, with either color, um, but they are extremely interesting. Yeah. The other, white doesn't have to do um, these insane variations. There is what's known as the, uh, the Moran, and then honestly here it's pretty much a Queen's Gambit declined, but um, white's bishop also sucks. Right? But then later, white's going to play e4, or he's going to put the bishop over here, and it's going to be the same thing with black. And it's much more of a slower positional maneuvering game, which I have very little experience on as well. Uh, but it, there are uh, heaps and heaps and heaps of Grandmaster games that you, you can look at. But it's pretty much the same. It's going to be trying to expand the center and get the, uh, the bishops into the game at some point. So I, haven't, I didn't really do it justice, but that's the slab and the semi-slab in about two minutes. And those are the two or three, I guess, it depends if you count the slab and the semi-slab as one opening, but certainly the three main ways of declining, uh, with the, uh, the slab, the queen's camp decline, and the semi-slab. There's also some other variations, like there's things like the triangle system, which I honestly know nothing about. It's like a cross between all the openings. Um, there's like these strange A6 moves, which have recently become very popular. I know absolutely nothing about them, but... Uh, well, this is Black is trying to claim that this is a very useful waiting move um, before deciding whether to play the regular slab, the Queen's Gambit, the semi-slab, uh, what have you. And it does prepare an eventual B5 at some point. But beyond that, the actual specifics, you're going to have to go, uh, you'll go uh, somewhere else. But with all these openings, Black is trying to fight for the center and do something with this bishop. And White, he's trying to get easy development and usually, again, either expanding the center on the king side or get that minority attack uh, firing out. But there's also this um, funny little basket of exotic ways to uh, decline the Queen's Gambit. These are sometimes called the Queen's Gambit Refused. I think Chris Ward was the one who coined that. And it's they're just fun things to do. For instance, the Albin Counter Gambit, E5, take and then pushing the pawn in here. This is a reverse version of the, of the Falkbeer counter gambit for the King's Gambit. And this pawn, as you can see it's stopping this, sure. It's also stopping e3 from coming in. And there's actually a very famous trap, um, which is the very first time I played against the Albin counter gambit. I did this exact move. It looks perfectly natural. Unfortunately, after check, bishop b2, there's this wonderful move where you take the pawn. So you can't take with a bishop because the bishop is pinned to the king. Um, taking with the pawn is, of course, your pawn structure is absolutely terrible. That's not what you want. And if you try and take the bishop, like I did, haha, I want a piece. Unfortunately, after check, 
oh, you can't take it with the king because, uh-oh, you're going to lose your queen. And if you try and do this, there's this lovely little knight under promotion, and then you skewer the queen, that's GG. So um, I've only made that mistake once. That's a horrific trap to fall into. There's all sorts of uh, traps along here. So this is very different from other Queen's Gambit types games. So again, we've got this cramping structure. Black is going to see, hopefully he can win back the pawn. He'll do something like this. He also has easy development, possibly with checks. He can also just play f6 if you really wanted to. And then, let's, let's put on the board button. Oh, it's whatever. Which now he has the open f file. He's going to castle really soon, and Black's waste, uh, white is wasting time with the h3, so don't play h3 in this position. And it's a real gambit. Very, very different. Um, there is the Chigorin. Chigorin uh, variation. Which will. T and the reason this is so different is just imagine after something like take, take. The knight's in front of the C pawn, and in doing so, it's putting a lot of pressure here on um, on the center. And if white were to ever play e3, the knight's also supporting e4, or e5 here, and black is able to get complete active super development, and he's just doing absolutely great here. Um, there's an old rule, like dates back to Terash, which states that in Queen's Pawn games, with the Queen's Gambit, you generally don't want your knight to be in front of the pawn. Uh, it's very easy to get cramped. The C pawns are often what free your position. But here, the triggering version says, I don't care, we're just going to move forward. Um, you can imagine something like Knight C3. Um, Black has this option of taking the pawn, and now he's actually uh, he's threatening he's threatening here. right? You can imagine D5, the knight's going to move somewhere, the knight's in the center, uh, Black will often play E6, and then there'll be an exchange, and everything's fine. It's uh, a tactically interesting uh, position. If you're interested in this, um, again, this is about the absolute extent I know about this variation. Um, often with the Chigorin, is that you, um, if you don't know anything about Mikhail Chigorin, he was one of the great masters of the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, and one of the rare ones that actually preferred um, knights over bishops. After Steinitz, Terash, Capablanca, Lasker, it seemed as if uh, bishops were coming into... Re people began realizing how the strength of the bishops. Chigorin was always with the knights. And so in um, the Chigorin variations, for instance, knight c3, bishop b4, very often you're going to exchange a bishop for a knight. And it's often true over here as well, is black isn't afraid of um, exchanging the bishop for this knight. So it's going to be two knights against two bishops. Um, this is why the opening wasn't very uh, popular at you know the elite master level for so long, because they love bishops so much. And it's been relatively recently, because computers show that every opening is playable, uh, that there's actually a lot of tactical justification behind this. If you're actually interested in this, um, I know Simon Williams has played it a few times, and he has a chess-based DVD, I think. Um, that's probably the most recent version of uh, the Chagorin that you can see. But, you know, it's using knights and... Uh, not bishops. And is there one more? The last one I'm going to look at very quickly is just the Terash defense. I guess it's not really the refused. Um, this comes in and out of fashion. It has been in fashion probably since Kasparov, but uh, there's some ideas into it recently that show it. The main idea by playing c5 really, really quickly is take, um, take, is sooner or later um, white is going to take this pawn, leaving black with a weak pawn. But in exchange, we can see this bishop has... In fact, all of black pieces can move absolutely anywhere. So black, um, if you remember at the very beginning of the Queen's Gambit, I talked about how white can just put his pieces on these ideal squares. Well, in the Terash, it's black who gets to put all of his pieces on the ideal squares. That's great. The only downside is that this pawn is weak. And that, so if you look at the main line, if I can remember how it goes, it's something like this. Uh, la, 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 something like this. Let's just, that will just stop here. So we can see that black has his pieces are nice and active. Everything is great, but he has a weak pawn. And white is going to plop a knight there. He's going to get, you know, his other pieces over here. He's going to try and trade pieces. Well, black is trying to attack. 
Um, in grandmaster practice, often, you know, the structural activities worked, but in amateur level, this has worked quite well. And I've had some really um, nice games here, maybe not in this exact position, and it's been a long time ago, but just black's pieces move, and they move in ways that you don't see in any of the other um, Queen's Gambit declined, except maybe for the Albin, the, the counter gambit, but then you have to sacrifice a pawn. Here you're not sacrificing a pawn, you just have a pawn weakness. But that's fine. Uh, interesting. It's, it's, a, it's worth a look somewhere. I don't know any recent uh, work on that. Jacob Agard, I believe, did a couple of books, or at least a book. That's like 20 years ago on it. Uh, Eric Schiller had a book, but it wasn't really uh, well received. Uh, just like look at look at a few games, uh, play it out. It, it's some fun. But as a general overview, perhaps a little bit too long. But that's all the different ways or the ways that I know about how to decline the queen's gambit. If you're absolutely starting out uh, and you want to decline the queen's gambit, uh, I think the slav probably makes the most sense. And then you just have to develop. Oh, I'll just point this out on Chessable, you know, the website I keep plugging. They have what's called the short and sweet slav. It's, it's free, it contains some theory and ideas, and it goes into more detail. And so if you're at all interested, take a look at that. On the flip side, with the Queen's Gambit declined, there's a Grandmaster repertoire. Um, I think it's like three series. This one isn't free, but I'm told it's absolutely excellent, and it explains how to play black exactly in these positions, much better than I can. Maybe I should have pumped that at the beginning. Um, and so if you want to nail down a, um, a repertoire that based around the Queen's Gambit decline. That's Alex... I, Alex, yeah, I don't know his... I don't know how to say his name or what it is at the moment. I'll put a link here and you can, uh, you can take a look. Um, but the, the bonus of, of that is because he focuses on this pawn structure is that it also works against... Um, it's a repertoire against c4 and against knight f3 and everything besides just 1d4. So he provides coverage against everything. So that's what makes it uh, really nice. I haven't actually... I, studied it or bought it because again I have no interest in playing those openings as black but there you go <sighs> so uh, hopefully that was interesting and useful I apologize I rambled a little bit but that is the Queen's Gambit decline tomorrow is going to be a much shorter video in under 10 minutes I'm going to teach you how to play the Queen's Gambit accepted um, an opening that I have played and I have some experience with and maybe you should watch that video first doesn't matter so uh, that's tomorrow. Uh, comment question, you know, criticize the heck out of me, you know, for rambling. But there you go. That's the Queen's Gambit declined in all different ways. So again, SmithyQ, SmithyQ.com. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.